So you can just take the, the tags and then look at the number. Move on to the also a piece of this 21B, uh, White Point County Fish and Wildlife Report, John Tilburg. For the record, uh, John Tilburg, Chief of Fisheries for Kendall. Uh, Chairman Robinson, Commissioners, I have an update on some White Point County Fisheries issues, unfortunately, because of the lack of health and quality of the front. Also, like Robert. And I will speak loud and hard.
Um, the second issue that comes is uh, mercury contamination in 2006. Um, routine sampling that we do statewide on an annual basis found elevated methyl mercury levels in fish collected from Cummins Lake. These are pretty significant levels um, for the warm water fish. Uh, well over one part per million in both northern pike and largemouth bass. And in rainbow trout, it was uh, 0.85 parts per million. Um, anything below one part per million is within the FDA uh, consumption advisory that we use uh, in working with the Division of State Health. Uh, EPA recommends a 0.3 level, uh, which I won't go into other than to say that that's not the standard that we've generally been using for health advisories in Nevada for a number of reasons, including typical background levels in the Western United States for fish for all city water, which often are, are pushing that, that EPA limit, even in the absence of any specific contaminant influx. Uh, regardless, a health advisory was issued for uh, Cummins Lake recommending no consumption of northern pike and largemouth bass and no more than one rainbow trout per month expressed as one meal, which is an eight ounce filet is how that's described by Division of State Health. Um, those standards were developed by the Nevada State Health Division working in cooperation with both Vendale and EPA. Uh, and those, we have advisories for a number of waters around the state, including Cummins. Uh, that standard is particularly applicable to pregnant women, nursing mothers, and children. Um, that, those identified elevated mercury levels in the fish tissue uh, subsequently led to some follow-up work by EPA to see if they could identify, um, and NDP to see if they could identify what those sources were and, and why Cummins Lake had those elevated levels. Um, there was preliminary soil sampling done in 2007 by the two agencies, which identified two possible sources of those mercury inputs into the Cummins Lake system. Uh, there are two old mill sites that date back to the late 1880s, presumably we were used for processing gold ore, among other things, where mercury was used as part of that process. Um, one is the, the monitor mill site, which is on part of Tepco Creek that feeds Cummins Lake towards the north end. The other one is the Argus mill site, which actually is right on the shore of Cummins Lake, uh, towards the south west, southeast side. Um, Based on those preliminary results, they did a much more extensive study um, beginning in 2008, looking at both uh, soil and substrate, and also looking at, at food web effects, microinvertebrates, um, the fish, and a number of other characteristics to try to determine where and how that process called methylization, methylation was occurring in Cummins Lake, and also looking at what the options were for remediation of the mercury problem. That study was completed and released in September 2011. Um, this is an illustration from that report that shows, based on their sampling, the, the distribution of those sediments and the level of contaminants in Cummins Lake. Um, the scale is goes from red really bad to green not so bad. Um, and as you can see, there are two areas of the lake that, that are particularly affected. Um, the Argus Mill site, which has the highest concentrations, is located uh, in the lower right. And then there's also inflow from Stepco Creek, which shows an elevated area down near the dam. Um, that's because although the monitor mill site is very difficult to locate, there's nothing left other than what they can find by spell sampling. It appears that the inflow stream goes directly through that site, through the ditch. So it's moving some level, particularly probably to move some level of contaminants down to the, to the north end of the lake. Um, the EPA study came up with several options that could be done to address this problem. Um, they range from actual excavation of sediments, which require draining and drying the lake and then removing those mercury-laden sediments. Um, capping some areas of particularly contaminated soils, for example, areas around the Argus Mill site, which are directly adjacent to the lake. Um, diking off that southern part of the lake to perhaps isolate the movement of sediments down into the main lake basin, to the lower lake basin. Um, the Ruby Central Creek around the Argus Mill site 
which would at least reduce that continued input. Although they admitted they did not sample Steptoe Creek, so we know that it's happening, but we don't know exactly how extensive that is. If we don't know in the lake, that's a follow-up issue. Um, reduce the aquatic vegetation, deepening areas of the lake that might reduce vegetation growth, and reduce nutrient inputs. Those last three I mentioned are related to the fact that buildup of organic material apparently accelerates this methylization process of the mercury where it gets converted to, a, to an element that's actually harmful. So actions that would decrease submergent vegetation and decrease that process of um, that vegetation breaking down and the input of organic materials is one strategy to at least reduce the ongoing level of mercury conversion that's going on and keep it at least from getting worse. Um, Next steps because of the concerns here. Um, effective remediation following those recommendations is going to be difficult. Uh, physical remediation in Cummins Lake, which is things like sediment removal, capping, biking, is going to be a very expensive process. Um, beyond just the physical aspect of it, there's additional considerations because of what we're dealing with when we're dealing with, with environmental contaminants with the mercury laden sediment. Uh, EPA has made it clear that even though it may or may not qualify for a Superfund site, their funding to address that through the Superfund and other resources right now is limited or non-existent for the region of EPA that we're in. Um, the other thing that they've made clear is that they feel that the probability of success is uncertain. Uh, there, are, there are ways to do this, but the outcome is difficult to predict. And Success in this sense means reducing those methyl mercury levels to a point where the health advisory should no longer be needed. It's feasible, but it would be difficult to predict whether you're going to be successful in doing that. Um, and now also have an independent review of that EPA report done by uh, Dr. Justin at UNR, who is an expert in working with, with mercury and other contaminants. She essentially supported the EPA conclusions and recommendations and recommended that strategies that, that somehow minimize that disturbance and in input of existing sediments and work towards selectively controlled vegetation to reduce that future methylation rate are probably the most practical things that could be done. Um, potential near-term op near -term options. Um, one thing that would help reduce that ongoing input, at least in the northern part of the lake, closer to the dam, would be to look at, at realigning that step toe creek input so that it bypasses the mill site. One of the issues there is that you need to do a lot of soil sampling because the site is so dispersed, no one's quite sure where all that is, even with the EPA sampling. It would require quite a bit of additional soil testing to make sure that that was put in a place where we would truly avoid those contaminated sediments. Um, and then options for remove or control aquatic vegetation, because that would help reduce that rate of methylation of the, of the mercury and that continuing input into the food chain and into the tissue. Uh, we're very supportive of actions that would address both this and larger scale remediation. Uh, however, the bottom line for us is that it's going to take community support and external grant fund, grants and funding sources to implement any really substantive remediation strategies because of the cost of this. It, it's going to be a very expensive process and I really can't even put a dollar we haven't done estimates yet, or don't have estimates to indicate what kind of dollar amounts we're talking for large scale remediation, but it's probably in the, at least in the tens of millions of dollars. Cummins Lake Dam is another issue. Um, we've looked at that. We've had a couple of engineering estimates on both repair and raising of the dam. Currently, because of an MDOT requirement that they want to move. US 93 off of the dam if this is done and put it back in its old alignment and realign the highway. Um, that took the cost up to about $14 million, um, of which I believe that the uh, cost estimates just for the dam work itself are in a range of, of three to five million. But MDOT's desire to move the highway significantly increases that. Um, the advantage in doing this uh, would be increased storage, uh, increasing available fish habitat, and increase those depths 
uh, on some areas where we want to discourage vegetation. The potential downside is it also increases that exposure to some of the contaminated sediments at Argus we know that are currently above the water line, even in high water. So that's a consideration we have to think about. Um, the current water budget, what's really available on step toe, would really only allow filling it to that new capacity in light years, but there are some significant advantages in being able to take advantage of that when we do have years where we have water that we can store from it. In terms of, of the fishery restoration, that's a process that we see proceeding independent of contamination remediation. We've waited for some of these reports. We've held off to see what was implied. At this point, we need to move ahead. We don't have any guarantees of funding to do the large remediation. It could take years to do that. We feel pretty strongly that we need to get the fishery back online to benefit the sportsmen, to benefit the county, to benefit Cummins Lake itself. So this is a priority for us, and we're not going to wait for grants that may or may not exist in future undetermined funding and costs to address some of these large remediation issues. Uh, at this point, our timeline is completing project planning and legal compliance, of which there will be a lot to deal with in 2014, and moving ahead in 2015 with renovation of the fishery, uh, eradication of pike, and restoring the fishery. Um, confirmed with that, we're looking at being able to pursue uh, boat launch facilities and access improvements that we've already had in the planning stage and hopefully do those concurrent with the fishery restoration so that we'd have that package ready by 2015 or 16. Uh, the other issue here is that the proven approach in dealing with Cummins is needing to treat Bassett Lake simultaneously. Bassett Lake, uh, for those who aren't familiar, is located just northwest of McGill. It's 77 acres of capacity. It was constructed in the 40s by Tetcock. Um, Maximum depth about 9 feet and pretty susceptible to drought conditions. So variable storage. Um, currently contains northern pike, carp, and largemouth bass. Uh, similar to Cummings, it has a lot of the same characteristics of a pike population that is fresh and left a pretty limited resource for anglers. Um, and Bassett was probably the source of pike for that illegal introduction, introduction into Cummings Lake. Um, we think eradication in Bassett to remove pike is crucial to prevent future illegal introductions. It has really good potential for warm water fisheries, for largemouth bass and other things. And that's the strategy we want to pursue. Um, Bassett is going to be probably a pretty difficult system to address in terms of, of renovating that fishery and, and chemical treatment, which is one of the reasons why our timeline is so long to complete this project because we really feel that is going to be a challenge, but it's doable. Um, Cave Lake, again, 14 miles southeast, constructed in the 30s. It was uh, acquired by uh, Endow in 1971 that's currently managed as part of Cave Lake State Park. 32 surface acres, maximum depth of 60 feet, and fed by Cave Creek. Uh, a number of years ago, some major repair and potential replacement needs were identified by for Cape Lake Dam, um, including potential failure ongoing with the outlet structure and a number of other issues, structural issues. Uh, we are moving ahead with that. The engineering and design assessment is in the contracting process and will be completed in uh, FY14, hopefully before the end of this year, um, in which case we can move ahead with identifying how we'll be able to do necessary repair. Cape Lake is currently managed as, as a foot and take ratio of trout fishery. It averages um, more than 20,000 angler days a year. And much like Cummins Lake did in its heyday, uh, it attracts a significant number of out of area anglers to White Pine County. This graph here shows a demographic breakdown. The red box is White Pine County anglers, and the other two colors are, are other, other counties and other Nevada anglers and out of state anglers. Um, it also supports a reproducing ground trout fishery. And in fact, the current state record ground came from Cape Lake in 1984, 27 pounds, uh, five ounces. We're currently assessing the feasibility of introducing an additional game fish species in the reservoir, that smallmouth bass. There's been a lot of local interest in that. Um, I think that's so 
entirety of the reservoir and a very high level of use and also attracting a lot of visitors here for really what's the family foot and take trout fisheries. So we want to we want to weigh those options carefully before we proceed. The other thing to consider is the opportunities that we're able to move ahead with both uh, Cummins and Bassett. So we have some real opportunities there to provide that warm water fishing opportunity. And that is all I have and I'd be happy to take any questions from the commission. Commissioner Wright. I understand that there are other sources of pike in the this portion of the island that were a problem, potential reseeding of Cummins once it was cleaned out eventually. Um, that was discussed in meetings, many meetings past. Are there any others? Is that still the case? I'm sorry? But there are other sources of potential pike to, that might be brought well, in. Well, there, there's other sources. I don't know really any significant ones here. There are certainly sources in Utah and other places where people could bring fish in. I mean, you could never... In Nevada. In Nevada nearby. I'm not aware of anything rich. You know, I'm not sure there? what's left in terms of TD reservoir. I don't think there's anything yeah. else out there. Right now. Talk out there before. No, I thought there was somewhere else. So this came up. Well, I had the first commission I was about 2007. Mm -hmm. There was at least two or three other sources they were talking about at that time. I, I'm about. honestly not sure any of those other ones were out there in the landscape anymore. I don't think they are. Okay. And at that time, I mean, it was seemed imminent that. Okay clean out the lake within a year or so, didn't quite have a timeline, and now it's I mean, half a dozen years later, and we're still a year Well, again, we do, we do have a timeline, and a large part of that delay was the EPA was waiting on the EPA and waiting for the results of, of the contaminants work that was ongoing, because we didn't want to invest a significant amount in restoring the fisheries if we ended up with information indicated that, that addressing some of these mercury problems were either going to be or something that would be either relatively expensive or able to be done fairly quickly. It's obvious that's not the case, based on the information that we have now. So the best course of action, in our opinion, is we need to move ahead and get that history back online. Yeah. And we'll address the other the contaminant issues as we're able to do that, working in cooperation with the community and whoever else wants to part with that. And capping it, obviously, that would appear to be the easiest, simplest, cheapest thing. I mean, there's substance out there and there's mines used all the time to cap things with ferrite. Well, I, I, I'm not an environmental contaminants person, so they just I honestly can't say. I'm just working off the information that we get from NDP and, and EPA as far as what, what the feasibility of these things are. So I couldn't address that, but I was not left with the impression that it's, it's particularly easy in this circumstance. Interesting. Just for the record, I'm sure the mic will pick me up. I don't have much. The house had folks provide me a very brief update. It doesn't seem to be a heck of a lot going on with wild horses. But see, the Forest Service and BLM to hold public meetings on a proposed Spring Mountain Wild Horse and Borough Complex Bird Management Area Plan Project. So those hearings are coming up in the uh, end of June. So if folks want to get involved in uh, management of horses down there in the Spring Mountain Range and associated areas, now is your opportunity. I guess everyone saw the, I haven't seen the report myself, but the press release, the National Academy of Science uh, panel review of the uh, BLM's Wild Horse and Burrow Program. They were fairly critical of the program of gathering and warehousing horses and whatnot. And they strongly suggested that uh, to continue to do that as a waste of public funds. They're, they came out with a strong push for birth control for horses. Our concern with that and the press release I saw is that uh, they didn't really get into or I didn't see any discussion on the impacts to other wildlife species and habitats out there. Um, they, they had 
this laissez-faire attitude about just let the horses do their thing and you know kind of control their their uh, their own population levels with a little assistance. But once again, uh, I don't think that we've had any folks that looked in depth at the report. But the press releases I saw did not get into the ecological impact of having those horses out there. So that was a cause for concern for us. Um, I'm sure you've all heard about the Eagle Sanctuary. Uh, Madeline Pickens' proposal up in Elko County. Uh, we've now signed on uh, MOU as the cooperating agency. BLM was surprised that we had an interest in that. And uh, I was surprised that they had that, that, that thought. But, uh, yeah, we're certainly interested in being participating in that process. So now we're, uh, we're signed on as a cooperating agency. So, uh, that's all I have. Uh, I, Tony had a little update on the uh, shelter. Yeah, I had a meeting with the manager uh, from Sheldon um, a week or two ago. Um, one of the things that came up was uh, horses and, and the refuges for plants. Um, they currently have 800 horses and 200 burrows uh, on the refuge, and they have uh, money to do a roundup and, and zero those out. Um, unfortunately, they don't currently have any off ramps for those animals until they have somewhere to put them, somewhere to go with them, they're not going to be able to do that. Um, so they were still exploring options uh, somewhere to get rid of those, those animals. Another thing that, that came up in discussion is that they've typically done their horse roundups or gathers um, during some of our problem order hunts up there, and we've, we've often got flack over that. I spoke with them about that. And apparently there's a relatively small window that they are required to operate in. Uh, poles uh, on the front end, they have to wait until poles are of a certain size. Um, so they can't go in there before the season, and then they have access issues after the season. At least that's, that's what I was told. Hopefully they'll find some off ramps to be able to zero the population out and won't have to worry about gathers uh, conflicting with pronghorns and hunts in the future. The funding source uh, for the uh, horse and burrow gathers on the Sheldon is uh, invasive species dollars. So on the, on the refuge, they can call them invasive species, uh, but off the refuge, they're all protected uh, under the uh, Wild Horse and Burrow Act. Is that an implication that, that wild horses aren't needed? Uh, yeah, they stated that explicitly. That's yes. their, their belief, yeah. But, but they obviously aren't all on the same page at the federal level. So one organization thinks that way, the other may not. Well, I, I think they all think that way. I think they're just, they can't act, uh, can't all act the same way because of the yeah. wild horse burrow. Sagebrush Ecosystem, uh, Sagebrush Ecosystem Council update, Director Wildly and Commissioner Harry. We uh, continue to uh, have an ex officio seat uh, on the Sagebrush Ecosystem Council, now codified in statute, um, meeting uh, roughly monthly. Uh, just uh, an official meeting schedule to take us uh, through the next six, eight months or so. Um, we're addressing threats as they come individually. The uh, Sagebrush Ecosystem Council, as I've indicated in the past, is, has uh, uh, membership representing different interests. Um, Vice 
Chairman Drew represents uh, hunting and, and fishing on that council. Um, the council cooperates with a technical team. The technical team is currently taking uh, identified issues, one issue at a time, and presenting that information to the Sagebrush Ecosystem Council. Um, recently, I think the council and technical team have, have realized um, they can benefit from greater scientific expertise, and so they've created a, a science team or scientific advisory panel that will now um, assist the technical team by providing um, threat-specific experts uh, to familiarize the technical team with, with all the literature, and the technical team will make recommendations to the council. Um, I, I guess I would ask if uh, Vice Chairman Drew has anything to add to that or share. Yeah, just a couple points. I guess uh, our last meeting was uh, Monday, June 17th, so it's been a long week for the meetings. And I think our next meeting will be July 31st. Obviously, I think anyone is, that's interested can attend the meetings. They're open to the public. If you have questions or comments, you can always work through me. I can get you on the update list for that, too. Um, one of the things that we did in one of the recent meetings was we did adopt a formal mission statement. I'll just read that so everyone understands what that is. Uh, the Sagebrush Ecosystems Council's mission is to maintain and restore functional and resilient sagebrush ecosystems to benefit all species while allowing for various land uses. This will be accomplished by working through a diverse coalition of public and private stakeholders. As Director Wasley pointed out, we've been kind of taking each of the threat factors one by one and kind of doing some background information. I think we're going to go more towards some recommendations on action for some of those. For the last council meeting, um, Pete Coates is developing a statewide model that's uh, ongoing. And then we've also had some presentations in terms of information on our and ideas on how to implement a statewide mitigation banking or crediting system program. So those are, I guess, the main focuses um, that the council has in front of it at this point. Um, AB 461 did pass. I think it included most of the, or all of the amendments that we had proposed and also included some additional language to get uh, NGO involvement once the crediting system moves forward, which I think is a very <coughs> positive thing. Um, and with that, I think each of the appointed members will be basically reappointed since it's now a law in the books as of maybe July 1, something like that. Um, it sounds like, you know, my guess is that most of the membership will remain the same. Um, the position uh, that I was under with the executive order as a sportsman has now been changed to a representative of the commission itself or a, a designee of, of this body. So um, that's been codified and um, set forward. So I think those are the kind of the high points at this point. I'd be willing to answer the question. Any questions of the commission? Okay. Seeing none. Do you have anything else to add, Director Larson? Okay. Okay. We we'll move on to agenda item G, Department Activity Report. Secretary <coughs> uh, Just a, a few things of interest. Uh, yesterday, the department enacted an emergency um, regulation to limit trout limit at Wild Horse Reservoir. The reservoir is down at 30% uh, of capacity. And uh, compared to the levels <coughs> that existed in 2007 when we had a significant fish kill, um, it's anticipated that we'll see uh, a significant uh, event this summer. The idea was to try to take advantage of that resource um, rather than just have a bunch of fish turn up belly up in the, in the water. Um, that went into effect yesterday and will remain in effect um, through October 15th. Uh, supported by uh, Elko County Advisory Board as well as the Elko County Commission. Um, there's a lot of coordination and, and effort uh, put into that at all levels. Um, the agency also uh, called the stocking uh, for wild horse off this spring so that we didn't uh, waste those resources realizing the storage was already compromised. Um, another item is uh, an update on the video conferencing. I wanted to, to read from an email, um, kind of outlining where we are on that. There's been a lot of, a lot of questions. 
Endow's approved FY14 budget, which begins July 1, includes $78,000 for Viacom video conferencing equipment to be installed at Endow's three regional offices, Reno, Las Vegas, and Elko. The purpose is to facilitate video conferencing for both Endow staff meetings and for commission meetings. This includes equipment to capture video feeds from the equipment for purposes of web streaming and archiving of commission and committee meetings. We're currently in the process of reevaluating the equipment we budgeted for. It's been over a year since it was originally scoped. We want to make sure that we're getting the right equipment to meet our needs. One thing we've been looking at is the process for video streaming and archiving. As conceived in our equipment budget, we would be responsible for handling the video. It would live on our servers. As an alternative, we're looking at other products and services to provide this capability. For instance, we've been speaking with uh, Granicus, a company called Granicus. They're the company that serves both the Elko County Commission and the Nevada Legislature. They offer an excellent system at modest cost. They would host the video on their own servers. Uh, we would still need most of the video conferencing equipment, cameras, monitors, microphones, etc. but they would handle everything on the back end for streaming and, and archiving. And our plan is to have a system in place by the end of the calendar year. Any questions on uh, video conferencing? Um, completely unrelated issue, uh, quick update on the Devil's Hole Pupfish. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Endow, National Park Service, uh, been paying a, um, a lot of attention, a lot of uh, meetings and efforts uh, trying to address um, what should happen with the Devil's Hole pupfish uh, emergency type strategies. Most recent surveys indicated that uh, there could be, be as few as 35 uh, pupfish remaining. Um, so there's uh, some ideas uh, being explored if there's specific questions on um, what's going to happen there? We could uh, have uh, fisheries uh, chief John Chover um, answer any questions on that. But the idea, as I understand it, is that um, discussion right now is to salvage some eggs, a portion of the eggs, and, and raise them in captivity. Some of them. Um, you had a you had an update on the Colombian sharp-tailed grouse efforts, but we did uh, document um, uh, lack and, and several nests. Association with that reintroduction effort. Um, Bighorn sheep and mountain goat interaction study uh, is, is continuing in the Rubies and East Humboldt. Um, as you know, we, we brought um, bighorn sheep down from Alberta, some Rockies, reintroduced them into the uh, East Humboldt, um, sampled all those animals. Uh, many of them have GPS collars. We're monitoring their movements, monitoring their interactions. Um, and chronicling that. It's uh, kind of a live experiment, seeing where those rams go has been really interesting. Um, the last item I have, just as an FYI, the, uh, the department's uh, conserved wildlife license plates uh, exceeded the, the thousand plate sales required over a two year period um, to earn the permanent status. Any, any questions on any other agency activity?
governor's office was making contact with him to determine at that point if he believed he was still on all three uh, boards or commissions and he, in an email said, look, you can have a wildlife commission and you're not going to resign from any of the other <coughs> and this commission was not a play official philosophy. Okay. Any questions? It was my 
understanding, um, Ms. Bogle, that, that indeed, this indeed was was part of that, and that that was a theoretical discussion all along, but that he was indeed a member of the commission at this time. So I'll just come about an email talking about the vote. According to him, it was a portion of the part that was pending. So, okay. also I had a question on a different subject of, of the same litigation reports. There was a, and it was actually maybe a little bit of an update, it was a case very closely related to one that I think is still, was still in here about the, um, let me drag that page up, the, the Hage case, which is still listed here as our number three. three. Number three, there's another portion of this case, there's several portions of that case, and one of them did come before, I don't think that Endo was directly related to it, but it was very similar, and it was a whole there was a whole listing of um, trespass allegations that were directly related and all filed about the same time and the same deal as this one number three here. And out of in excess of 50 complaints by the government, they came up with they fined him $165.86 on a couple of them and said all the rest of them were totally invalid and it went on to, it was a huge 104 pages I believe was the decision and they, the judge filed several injunctions against the federal government for to stop further harassment of Mr. Hage on the case found basically that the BLM agents and the, at least one BLM, I believe there was a Forest Service person at fault in many of the stuff, and that's why in these almost unprecedented issues and injunctions actually against the federal government for paraphrasing harassment of them in that case. 165.88 after a huge case that time they came down, and that was the 24th of May 2013 by the federal court, that was the U.S. District, United States District Court decision. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Seeing none, we'll move on to agenda item 22. Uh, future commission meetings and commission committee assignments. Uh, we talked about 21B trail cam use. We're going to have to figure out how we're going to bring that one forward. LCB acts on it and does something next week. We won't have time to officially publicize that so we're properly noticed before the August meeting. So it's either LCB does something next week and gets it back to us, or we miss our window for the August meeting, which means we do it in September. Uh, so it's, it's not whether we want to do it in August, we want to do it in August. We are subject to laws and and other entities that need to cooperate with us to get us there. So, with that being said, if we can get it done by, so we can put it on the August agenda, it will be there. If not, we will deal with it in September. Kind of wait and see at this point. Uh, another thing I have on this agenda item is committee assignments. Since our last commission meeting, we have made a couple adjustments to committee assignments. On the trapping committee, uh, Jeremy, Dave, and I are 